going to ask the first question today. And okay. I, I would like for you to tell people how it came to be that you decided that plant-based was better than surgery in your practice and that, that was the direction you wanted to go. And one of the things that we were just talking about and we seem to have problems with all of us is getting our doctors on board with thinking that plant-based is the way to go or that has anything to do with our health. So if you could give us a little bit of advice or maybe some pointers about how we can approach our doctors about getting on board with supporting us in a plant-based diet. Sure. Yeah, and so, um, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a good combination between the two. I wouldn't say one's mutually exclusive of the other. In other words, uh, Western medicine still works. I still recommend it. I wouldn't say that plant-based diet is better than Western medicine. That would not be what I prescribe at all. So I don't say that plant-based diet is better than surgery. I say the two need to go together in the patients that I treat. Um, it, I kind of came at this many years ago when I went to get a life insurance policy test. I was a doctor doing weight loss surgery and found out that I had high cholesterol, hypertension, was overweight, had fatty liver. And you know, the doctors, my friends were like, yeah, let's put you on this pill and that pill and this is the side effect. And it just kind of got me thinking like, is this really what our bodies are meant for? Is this, this we're supposed to, we're just born with a lemon for a body? Uh, and so I started kind of looking around the world. Is this how it is everywhere? Lo and behold, find that we're the worst in here. Despite having the best Western medicine you could get, got the worst help. And that left me kind of on this very long path of lots and lots of research. I kind of became almost obsessed with research, looking at every paper there was about what we should be doing to be healthy. And everything I came across just came up to plant-based diets, plant-based diets. If you eat a plant-based diet, uh, you can prevent or cure, uh, reverse disease. And then I started looking at my patients and every patient was eating the same as me and uh, they were eating a diet very high in animal protein. In fact, that's all anybody talked about. Where do I get my protein? And yet when I went and looked at the healthier cultures in the world, they're not purposely avoiding, but they're not eating a lot of protein. And so there was this big disconnect between what you're hearing in Western worlds and what you're seeing in actually successful societies that live without Western medicine. And I started looking at my patients and I do these big surgeries on them and they lose weight but they go home they start eating exactly what they ate again so they lost some weight they've gone from a double cheeseburger to a single cheeseburger but they're not getting any healthier with that single cheeseburger um and so i started you know i changed my diet and saw a dramatic result uh started changing their diet and saw dramatic results and so now uh look if i could get someone on a plant-based diet to prevent disease i do it if i need to use western medicine i will do it but i use it as a tool to be combined with the Western medical the prescriptions I give a patient, whether it be surgery or medicine. As far as how to get a doctor to change, that's really hard. I, that's a, a doctor is not going to be very happy with a patient going in and talking to them. This is something you almost have to do on your own. In other words, take your doctor's advice as far as what medications and stuff you need, but try and prevent ever having to see a doctor to begin with by doing a plant-based diet. But I, I don't, you can talk to the doctors, there's gonna be some doctors that are gonna be open. Hey, listen, I've heard about this. I read this doctor's book called Proteinaholic, whatever you want to do. Um, and I'll give it, and I, you know, provide a voice you can make. But, but most, there will be some doctors that are receptive, some that are absolutely are not. Yeah, mine was not as receptive at, at reading Dr. Esselstyn's book at all. Diet has nothing to do with it. It's your genes. Right, and that's what I thought before I actually went out and educated myself. And that's, that's what you're taught in med medical school. Right. You're taught there's a problem and a medical solution to that problem. So what we end up doing is putting band-aids. There was a famous uh, doctor, Dr. Pat, who um, he was treated, he was a general surgeon like me, and he was in London. And he treats the same diseases as I do. Cholecystitis, appendicitis, um, obesity, heart disease. And he noticed, because there was a, a large population of uh, expatriates from Uganda that lived there, and he noticed that these people get the same diseases as the Anglo-Saxons, you know, heart disease, obesity, diabetes. And he wondered, if he went to Uganda, would he see those same diseases? So he went to Uganda, and he didn't see any of these diseases. There was no cholecystitis in Uganda. There was no diverticulitis. There was no obesity. And um, 
And, and so he starts looking very specific. Why are they getting it in London but not getting it in Uganda? What he found is that it was a lack of fiber. We became a very big part of fiber. But he has this great cartoon. And it shows these doctors mopping a floor with a faucet pouring water onto the floor. So instead of turning off the faucet, they just keep mopping up. And that's what doctors are doing. We're just, we keep treating problems with medicines and surgeries that really get started by the diet to begin with. Right, right. Um, I was wondering, uh, Dr. Davis, if you could kind of pretend like we are patients in your office and not to get a specific, legal. pardon? That might not be legal. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want specific information, but general guidelines of the kinds of things that if I came to you and I, I had a weight problem and I have a lot of other health problems, what kinds of things would you tell us that would be a general comment to us, to guide us? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's a long conversation I have with patients and it starts with seeing what they're eating and what they're doing and, well, you're eating this, why are you eating this? Is there something we could do different? So it's much more complex than that. But my general recommendations are predominantly plant-based. I don't use the term vegan or vegetarian. Um, to me, you know, being the fact that I'm vegan, that I'm not wearing leather shoes or leather belt, I do that for ethical reasons that I've developed since becoming uh, plant-based. But um, I have a discussion with them. First of all, enough with macronutrients and micronutrients. I never want any patient to ever count how much protein they're getting. Utterly ridiculous. Um, I totally eliminate that from the conversation. I also kind of eliminate the calorie count. So we don't do calorie count, but I do talk with them about calorie density of foods. And I give them handouts on calorie density. We talk about what foods are high in calories per gram versus what's low in calories per gram. And I want them eating a lot of low calorie density food because you can eat low calorie density food in mass so that you get full without getting a lot of calories. So for instance, you know, like a little tablespoon of oil has got a lot of calories. That same amount of calories in a salad is like this big. So you're gonna fill yourself up with the salad, but not with the oil. So that's a big thing to do. I also do time to eating. So I try to keep people eating within a 10 hour window so that they don't eat a lot at night. They have to work fast, it tends to hold calories down. Um, exercise, movement, not strenuous, go run a marathon, but getting eight to 10,000 steps a day and being active every day. Um, we go through behavioral therapy methods on how to change diets. I try to have people eat at the same time every day, be very specific about what their feeding times are so they don't graze all during the day. And then I tell them things that are comforting, like I don't care how much fruit, vegetables, starch, and beans you get. You can eat as much as you want. No one's gonna get fat eating apples. No one's gonna get fat eating grapes. Uh, and, uh, and so you can eat as much of it as you want because of the water content, because of the fiber content, you can fill yourself up before you get too many calories. Okay, and do you want to come ask your question? Because we have somebody that's reading your book right now and while we were waiting to get you, we wanted to ask. Well, good afternoon, I'm Lynn. Hi. Um, my question was, um, I just listened to your talk and you said eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and I didn't see a lot about the grains. And grains. grains too, okay. So my problem is unless I eat grains, I'm not full. Oh, so yeah. I, like I, if I eat just fruits and vegetables, I'm starving. Yeah, so sure. everybody is, and that's a big reason people go on a vegan diet and all they eat is fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. and then they're starving all the time. Mm -hmm. One of the most important thing they eat is starches. Uh, the starches are the base of every major healthy society. So if you look at the flu zones, uh, the National Geographic study where they looked around the world for the healthiest people, number one food they ate was starches. And some of it was coming in the form of grains, such as rice. So in the Okinawans, they ate the most, the, the most calories the Okinawans eat come from sweet potatoes, next from rice. When you go to the Sardinians, they eat a lot of grains, um, and different grains, barley, and all kinds of stuff. Um, but lots of beans too, lots of potatoes. In fact, the vast majority of my diet is starches and grains, fruits and vegetables coming I mean, in good quantities, but starch and grains number one. Okay, all right, thank you. Sure. Hi Garth. Uh, Hi. I've been following you on Twitter, read your book when it first came out, and I uh, see that you announced that you're uh, 
moving in April. Uh, I think that, that move in, intrigues me somewhat because obviously I'm not a patient. I'm uh, following you from afar and I just wonder if you're going to be maybe a little more accessible to people like me with the move. Uh, you know, I don't know yet. We're still trying to, um, I've got a lot to do up here. So Asheville is fairly underserved. They've got a, a lot of obesity in the mountain region of Western North Carolina. Uh, I'm going to be working with groups like the, the Cherokee Indian tribes there. And we're working on all kinds of programs, but I am, they're very uh, uh, interested in plant-based programs and I will be working on them. I don't know if you know what CHIP is, but it's a plant-based program. Yes. And there's a cardiologist up there that I'm going to be working with, and we're going to be doing a lot of those kind of programs. My goal is Asheville used to be, people in the, it, it, way back in the past used to go to Asheville for health reasons. They used to have all these health spas and stuff. We want to recreate that there cool. and make it a destination place for health. So That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Hi. I'm trying really hard to do the plant-based. Uh -huh. I have been since March, but I hate to cook, and I'm yeah. kind of lazy about it. And I like to buy the processed things like bread already made and yeah. pasta. And I'm wondering because our club says not to eat processed foods, how that fits in with the plant-based. Is it just because it has fats in it? or the other chemicals that are not good for us? Or what is this about the process part? Yeah, and the, yeah. other, the other question, one more thing, alcohol. Nobody ever addresses <clears throat> drinking wine or beer, or what about the alcohol? I know a calorie is not really a calorie, but how does that fit in? <clears throat> sure. Those are my two questions. Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> with the second question, with the alcohol, Look, there's been a lot of studies. It goes both ways. There has been some evidence that a glass of wine a day may be beneficial uh, for disease, but there's been also evidence that alcohol may be bad as far as cancer is concerned. Problem is, it's really hard to study alcohol in separation from everything else. So if you're drinking alcohol, you may also be having other bad, you know, just because you drink alcohol doesn't mean that's what's causing cancer. It may be the other food you're eating with the alcohol. Uh, and so mm, that's a, that, that could be a problem. Alcohol has seven grams of calories, uh, uh, seven calories per gram, whereas carbohydrates and protein have four calories per gram. So it's a, it's a more calorie dense. So back to what I was talking about, calorie density. It's more calorie dense. But I drink alcohol. I just do it in moderation. I don't do it on a daily basis. Uh, but on a weekend, I'll have a glass of wine, I'll have a beer here and there, especially moving to Asheville, which is the beer capital of the world. Uh, and so I'll have beer and I'll have wine. Sometimes I don't think that's harmful. Now, when you get to uh, processed food, it, it just depends on what the processing and, and how processed it is. Part of the problem is like, you take a whole grain. So we're just talking about grains being good for you. You take a whole grain, but you start processing it. So you, know, you get like steel cut whole loaves, right? Or you could get instant oats. Now the processing that happens with the instant oats is they were shucking out part of the fiber so that you're not getting as much fiber with it. So now it's a higher glycemic index food, so it's gonna cause more of a sugar uh, rush, which is gonna cause more of an instant response, which is gonna make you hungrier soon. Um, and so that's part of the problem. And then of course the chemicals. I mean, you could get like, you can make your own almond milk, or you could buy almond milk from a store and it might have Coraginate in it and all these other chemicals that we're not sure are good for you. Truth be told, I'm like you. I'm not really big on, on you know, cooking and stuff like that. So I buy some processed foods. And, but I usually try. Look, I eat pasta, but I eat whole wheat pasta, and I and I always I, there's little things you can do with whole wheat pasta. Like you cook it, then you refrigerate it, then you reheat it, and that makes it into a resistant starch. Load it up with vegetables and tomatoes. You got a great meal. That's not bad with that. I tend to, look, I have mock burgers and things like that that are processed little sticks, but for the most part, I try to keep most of my diet very simple. Oatmeal and berries for breakfast. A big salad with a baked potato and beans for lunch. Um, there are now meal prepared, uh, preparation foods like purple carrot, things like that. I, I subscribe to those too. Okay. 
Thank you. Sure. Could you talk a little bit more about the calorie density and the, the, I know there's charts online that you can find, but how the satiety of the starch and the whole grains compared to flowers and that type of thing and the vegetables and the oils? I think that it, helps people if they the, see it that way. density and the satiety are actually two different things. They don't actually um, match together perfectly. Um, but the, the idea behind the calorie, so there was a, a lady named Barbara Rolls, and she did all these studies called volumetric eating. And what she found is that in her lab, the weight of the food you ate tended to be the most important thing for satiety. So she wants you eating a lot like big portions, which is different than what we think about in our society. We think, oh my God, I got portion control, but you found when people portion control, they didn't do as well. And so if you're gonna eat big quantities, those quantities better not have a lot of calories. And so we know things like fruits and vegetables because they're very high in fiber and water have very, very low calories in them. Uh, the starches have a little bit more calories uh, per gram, but interestingly, in a big study where they had people eat uh, uh, different foods and then they measured them for satiety long term. Starches were the number one thing for satiety. So uh, there's nothing more satiating than a baked potato. Now the problem with a baked potato, like in America, baked potato is like a bad thing. You're like, how could you eat a baked potato? Because we've been eating a baked potato with sour cream and cheese and bacon bits and whatever uh, else is on there. But when you start focusing on, I tell people to stick to the, if you, if you go online and look at calorie density charts, you'll see different numbers. Less than 700, you'll notice are all the grains and the legumes and the, the fruits and the vegetables are obviously at the lowest. Right. Did I answer your question? It is a perfect diet or stream that you can eat all the foods you want of anything over that line, pretty yeah, much. To, to grow. It, because I used to, I, you know, when I was overweight and not as, as healthy, I used to count calories and weigh things and oh my god all this nightmare and, and weight watchers and how many points i had 10 points for breakfast and better have 12 <laughs> points for lunch and i'll have five points. you know you just can't that's not how the body works now you know people say to me um people say to me um, you must have a lot of willpower to eat i'm like it takes zero willpower i'm never hungry i'm always full i always feel fantastic um i eat big meals and i'm always satious this is, i don't even feel like i'm I, i'm not dying just my lifestyle and since then I am I went to my 25 year high school reunion and um, uh, my old classmates don't look like I do uh, you know but they're like what are you what are you doing what's your secret I'm like well, I'm eating a plant-based diet oh I can't do that <laughs> and you on your Lipitor with your belly I don't know what's going on. <laughs> We're sorry you weren't with us earlier because my husband did a pantomime with his big belly and then it went away with a blimp this time. Oh, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, uh, we have a question about supplements. Um, do you, you think it's better to get it from the food? Do we get enough from food or should we look at supplements? I, I think food can get you just about everything. If you're going completely vegan, it can't get you B12. Um, now, I see meat eaters with B12 deficiencies too. Um, I've seen vegans with low b12 with no symptoms of having a low b12 but i still recommend that vegans take a b12 and so i take a b12 once a week i take 1000 units uh supplement. um vitamin d tends to be low in everybody meat eaters and vegans i will do vitamin d i usually take it three times a week 4000 units not positive about the omega-3s. If you're getting a lot of ground flaxseed and stuff, I think you're getting enough omega-3s. There's been some evidence that vegans tend to convert over time the, the fatty acid that's in like flaxseed and chia seeds into the DHA that you really need. But there, there may be some benefit from omega-3 fatty acids. I take a microalgae uh, oil three times a week. So I'm really, that's all, that's, that's, the, that's the total of my supplementation that I take. And um, so somebody's got a question right now. I'm going to ask you the one I wanted to ask you about. And that was a video I saw where um, you did a piece on a prescription pad. And we've got yep. little prescription papers in our chairs. And what did you do with your prescription pad? So my goal was, I, I worked with some uh, this community co-op from farmers that, that produce fresh produce. 
And my goal was I wanted doctors to prescribe fruits and vegetables. So I gave all these doctors prescriptions so they could write fruit and vegetables. And we set up a pharmacy, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, at the hospital where we had these boxes of fruit and vegetables and they got a discount. And I, we're going to do that in Nashville too. And it, it worked well. It was, a, it was kind of expensive in the end. And, uh, and so it kind of fizzled in because I couldn't get the doctors going. But I think in Nashville we're going to get that big. Yeah. So you gave the pads to the doctors? Yes. And they and I wrote myself. And so I write people a prescription. Uh -huh. They go to the pharmacy. They okay. get a box of fruit and vegetables that was fresh, uh, organic, and they got it at a discount price. Wow. Is there a question in the audience I could ask for you? Anybody? Oh, okay. good. What about nuts and seeds? What? What about nuts and seeds? Oh, nuts and seeds, Dr. Davis. Yeah, that's a good question. So nuts and seeds, uh, uh, amongst my plant-based uh, uh, doctors, um, all over the place. <laughs> some that swear by them and some that swear uh, not by them. When you look around the world, again, I like to look at cultures that are doing it right, that are living long, healthy lives. Nuts tend to be a part of that diet. Now, again, they're doing other things right. So it might not be that the nuts are the thing that, that matters. It might be that they're eating vegetables and not eating a lot of meat. Um, nuts are off that they're on the plus side of that 700 uh, calorie density range that's what you'll, you'll see on the chart the nuts are on the wrong side i like nuts i do nuts every day i do one handful of nuts um i think the problem with nuts is that we go overboard on nuts so we're having almond butter for breakfast and we're having uh nuts for lunch and then we're sitting in the TV, and then you can get too many calories that way um, and so I do think that there's importance in getting monounsaturated fats that you get from nuts and from getting polyunsaturated fats from seeds. And so I do incorporate them in my diet. Uh, but whereas I can eat as much fruit, vegetables, uh, potatoes as I want, I do limit how much nuts and seeds I eat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another one. What okay. is re his recommendation on flax seeds? What's your recommendation on flax seed? We were talking about seeds and nuts. But a tablespoon a day, whole flax seed that you then grind. Keep okay. in the refrigerator. Okay. Did you hear that? No. Okay. You want to repeat it, Dr. Davis? I do a tablespoon of flax seed a day, whether I mix it in smoothies okay. or sprinkle it on salads, but it's got to be ground. Okay. Uh, and so I put it in a coffee grinder okay. uh, and uh, keep them refrigerated because it could go bad. Okay. Is it okay to get the ground for already ground and put it in if the refrigerator? If you get ground, definitely refrigerated. If you get whole, you can just store it in like a, a, a okay. sealed. Okay, so once it's ground, it goes in the refrigerator. Got that? Okay, another question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's one. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, what was your I just had a question in regard to what are the best nuts to eat for you? In like almonds? Or Which kind of nuts are the best ones to eat? Like almonds or walnuts? You know, they all have their benefits. Like a Brazilian nut is loaded in selenium, like loaded. And we do tend to like selenium in our diet. So a Brazil nut once in a while is okay. Uh, almonds are great. Um, they tend to have one of the better omega-3 to omega-6 ratios. So you want more omega-3, less omega-6. Um, walnut's probably the best. Um, but look, you know, it doesn't really matter. A little variety is, is variety is the spice of life. A little bit. I, I, I vary my but I probably stick more in the than anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are your thoughts about uh, chocolate? Uh, I'm talking about you know not not milk fat. No, no, I'm talking about uh, cocoa that's 85% chocolate, very little sugar, and my son uh, is a, a very good runner. Uh, Gasparilla, you know, 15,000 runners. He comes in ninth, and he's oh, wow. he's your age. And he's having trouble with his uh, lower legs. Yeah, he's your age, yeah. Who are you? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, but anyway, uh, he had some trouble with uh, Achilles uh, at the insertion uh, distally. And uh, when, he, when he started putting in uh, uh, chocolate in his diet, this, you know, not milk fat because he doesn't do dairy, uh, he found that uh, things really improved. And that, uh, He's really getting toward the magnesium. Magnesium, yeah. it, it, uh, there's been some research come out about that just recently about magnesium. Some doctors are saying it's all about magnesium. I don't think they're right. It's but, never all about anything. Yeah. Be careful about these doctors that all they do is study one thing and then it's all about that one thing. <laughs> well, you, know, you know the saying, when you're a hammer, all the world's a nail? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
So, what's, what's your belief about uh, the need for magnesium in chocolate? Uh, I, I do chocolate every single day. I never miss it. I do it at night. I do a dark chocolate, 80%. Um, really, really, the, the, the studies on dark chocolate are really, really good. I've just started it, and I'm, I'm, I've found, you know, a half a bar. I can actually discipline myself. A half a bar, I feel, maybe it's because I don't get any caffeine. I don't get any caffeine in my diet at all. But that chocolate seems to give me a zing. It really does. Yeah, it does. And, and, and it's because of serotonin. So it's, uh, a lot of it has to do with tryptophan and serotonin. Uh, and so a lot of people, like, um, you know, that a lot of my patients that have sweets cravings, I have them do that. Now, of course, that chocolate is not sweet at all. No, it's, it's not. It's actually kind of sour. It's sour and bitter, but it tends yeah. to take away sweets cravings. So I tell them to get, um, I, I tell them to get it like the little single bars, the little squares. Do that one square, you're not going to want any sugar after that. Because it actually, if you look at it in the brain, it actually stimulates the dopamine receptors that your body's trying to stimulate with the sweets and, and other things. Thanks. Good information. I'll keep eating my chocolate. <laughs> I'm Nanette. We have some runners who have plantar fasciitis, and they yes. eat a lot of meat, fish, chicken, and eggs. My trainer I've had for 20 years, she's sitting over there while we're working out in the ice. And, and right. I think she needs some plant-based whole food she instead does. of maybe the other. So could you tell me so I can tell her what she needs to be eating? I eat meat. We know this. They did a great study where they took a group of people, um, and they did this with dairy, not meat, but the same holds with meat. They had them drink a glass of dairy or a glass of orange juice or a glass of water, and they looked at inflammatory meat eaters, like chemicals in the body that indicate inflammation. And with the milk, it went through the roof with the orange juice and, and the water bath. So every time they're eating, they're adding to inflammation in their body. That's not to say that you're never going to get injured as a vegan, because I've gotten injured and stuff. But you'll, you'll see, and there's actually a great movie that just came out on Amazon, and uh, it was on Amazon on iTunes called From the Ground Up. Uh, and you may even see me in it. Uh, but they. Um, they're interviewing all these athletes because a lot of athletes now are switching to a plant-based diet because of this anti-inflammatory effect. But the other thing we noticed in a plant-based diet is we're not the meat and the animal protein, uh, the type of amino acids in animal protein tends to be higher in acid. Uh, they have sulfur-containing amino acids that when it gets into your body, it actually negatively affects your body, it causes your body to go into acidosis. So your body then has to fight that, and has to fight that by taking calcium from muscle cells and so that could damage muscle cells and so all of this leads together to 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 a problem and so a plant-based diet with the anti-inflammatory effect with the phytonutrients with the magnesium yeah it's look i'm i'm 48 years old i'm running marathons I'm, uh climbing mountains I'm, you know lifting more weight than i did when i was 20 years old and i i say it's all because of my plant Okay. Well, I'm 82, and I'm getting ready to run the next half marathon at Celebration, and I'm over there on the Pilates Reform, and they're all talking about eating meat and beef and what's the best, and I'm over there eating this, and they all have plantar fasciitis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got your message here. I'll say that. I, I always wear t-shirts, you know, like, uh, uh, I've got 99 problems, but protein isn't one of them. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll think about you next week. All right, take care. We've got some questions that are coming in from some of our live streamers, and one of them is asking about uh, gluten sensitivities and how you know if you should avoid gluten. And there's there's just so much out there now about avoiding gluten. Is that something that we need to look at, or you know, it's so funny to me. I, I saw this funny uh, one of the actors was saying he's like. The, the fear of gluten has gotten so bad in LA that you could rob a bank with a bagel. <laughs> well, that thousands of years, grains with gluten in them were the source of life. How the Bible says, you know, like bread is the is the uh, is so important, and, and how all of a sudden are we worried about gluten? It's really ridiculous. And there's been a lot of studies showing that if you give people that say they're gluten sensitive. Uh, placebos, like you say, well, this doesn't have gluten in it. They're like, okay, I feel fine. This doesn't have gluten in it, but it does. They're like, okay, I feel fine. You know, it's it, it's really become, you know, it's one of these, we call it a nocebo effect. So you've heard the placebo effect. The nocebo effect is like telling you gluten is bad for you and it might make you feel bloated, 
and you know everyone in the world is bloated because of their microbiome, which we can get into. Then they eat a piece of bread and they get bloated all the time. Uh, I'm not a huge believer in gluten. I mean, if you've got celiac disease, that's that's another problem. I think most people have a messed up microbiome because of the diet that they're eating. And if you can correct that microbiome, you can eat whatever you want to eat. Now, if I put someone who's on a meat diet immediately on a vegan diet, they're going to get gassy and bloated, right. and they're going to look to uh, the gluten and say, oh, it's all gluten. But over time, their body will adapt and it will change. I do use with patients um, enzymes uh, to help break down um, some of the starches that they eat. Um, uh, you need alpha galactosidase. It's in Beano. It's cheap. It's easy, uh, easy to take. Um, I, I mean, you could avoid gluten pretty easily nowadays if you want to. I mean, if you really think it's gluten, if you're like, I don't care what the stock is, but then get gluten-free bread. You know, that, that's fine. It's um, not very good. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I eat tons of gluten. I tell my patients to eat gluten. I don't tell them to eat gluten because I don't tell them to eat any. I told me, you know, Ezekiel bread, all green breads like that. And, and uh, I, you know, I use probiotics on patients um, to try to get them into a better uh, microbiome. But there's a great study in Nature where they took a group of meat eaters. We used to think that your microbiome that you have was almost like a fingerprint. Like we all have our different signature of how many bacteroides and how many E. coli. Uh, but the interesting thing we found was that if you take meat eaters and you switch them to a plant based diet over a two week period, they actually change their microbiome. And then if you give them meat again, it goes right back to the meat eating microbiome. Right. Uh, and so if you give people to change their microbiome, they tend to be much more tolerant of foods. We have another question about eating a lot of kale and whether or not it's bad for your thyroid. And I think that goes to the, um, the certain vegetables are not good for your thyroid. It, do you know anything yeah. about that or do you believe that? It's, it's, very, it's funny to me because patients will be like, you know, they'll be hypothyroid and they'll come in to me and say, my doctor says it's because I'm vegan. And I'll be like, what does he tell all his meat eaters? So there's that, like thousands upon thousands of hypothyroid meat eaters that aren't eating kale. Well, how did, they just got it because of chance, but the person who gets it who's eating kale is because of kale. They're ridiculous. So there there's a lot about there right now about cruciferous vegetables not being good for your thyroid. I don't know if you've seen that, but there is a lot going around about that. I've seen it, and it's ridiculous. So um, <laughs> there was a pretty good set showing that vegans do not have a higher level of hypothyroidism. What this goes to is that these are goiterogens in that uh, cruciferous vegetables, soy, will bind iodine. And if they bind iodine, that can, if you're not getting enough iodine, make you hypothyroid. So there's that possibility, but you should easily be, in this day and age, there should be no, in America, there should, it should be easy to get enough iodine. Now there are, I do run into situations where this might happen, where someone's eating kale on raw food, they're a raw foodist, mm -hmm. and they don't add any salt to their diet. Mm -hmm. In that situation, that's a possibility that they could get an iodine deficiency. Um, and then they just need to supplement iodine. They don't need to stop eating kale, they just supplement iodine. Um, but if you're, I, I put salt on my kale and salad. I always use iodine salt and I'll get plenty of iodine. Thyroid level will be fine. Thank you. Hi, I have two questions. The first one, you talked about microalgae as a supplement. And I was wondering your thoughts on spirulina. Is that too processed, or would that be similar? Spirulina is good. There's been some issues with chemicals with spirulina. Uh, I, in a, it may be in the processing. It may be natural in it with the algae that they, they get it from. I don't typically use spirulina. It's got a lot of good stuff in it, but um, I was a little bit worried about some of the bad stuff they were finding. Okay, the second one, and not to beat the grains to death, but I do have a friend who is telling me about a book she's reading where grains are causing all of these diseases. So I don't know if you've done any reading on that, but what are your thoughts? That book is the most ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you. It's just, that book has no science in it. There's no science. I mean, compare my book to that book and look through the references. The healthiest populations in the world are eating tons of grains. So if grains are killing people, then why are the Sardinians living into their homes? Okay. That simple. I mean, if I feed you grains, if I overfeed you grains, nothing happens in your body. I, I feed you grains and I measure inflammatory mediators. Nothing. 
Meanwhile, grains have been associated with decreased diabetes, decreased, not increase. They've been associated with higher levels of folate, thiamine, and, and all these great B vitamins that are found in many of the grains. Uh, it, it's just preposterous. It's stupid. It's American stupidity. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. One of our live streamers um, in Lakeland was wondering about when they said, when you have diabetes, you have to be careful about sugars. So how can we eat all that fruit? Yeah. So um, you got to go to what? Okay. We're, there's a difference between type one and type two diabetes. So let me focus on type two diabetes. Type two diabetes is not caused by carbohydrates. All right. So these populations that are eating extremely high carbohydrates. Okinawans, all these different places, they don't, they have almost no diabetes whatsoever. As soon as they introduce fat into their diet, they get diabetes. And so China and Japan are starting to get this large increase in diabetes, and they're noticing it's because of their large increase in meat consumption. Meat is very, very strongly correlated with diabetes. If you look at the Adventist health population studies that they did in the Seventh Day Adventist, thousands, like 90,000 people over many years. All of them not smoking, all of them walking, all of them have different genetics, and they broke them down. A group that was eating a little bit of meat, but not too much meat, pesca, the pescatarians, lacto ovo vegetarians, and the vegans. The vegans have by far the least diabetes, then the next would be the lacto ovo, then the next pescatarian, etc., etc. And so the more animal protein you eat, the more you get diabetes. Now, why is that? Well, our bodies process sugars through our muscles. Our muscles, we are we are created to eat sugar. Every part about it, our saliva starts breaking down starch to sugar right in our mouth. We've got sugar uh, absorption all through our intestine. Every bit, every cell in our body thrives on sugar. Uses sugar to create ATP. The place that we most need to do that is in our muscles. Now those muscle cells, if fat gets into the muscle cell called intermyocellular fat, it starts to prevent that cell can create, create insulin receptors. If you can't create insulin receptors, you can't get the sugar into the cell. And so the problem with eating sugars when you're diabetic is that you can't process the sugars. And so, yeah, if you eat grapes and you're diabetic, you may get a spike in your sugar. But if you eat only grapes, so many years ago, there was a doctor in um, at Duke, um, God, why am I blanking on his brain? Uh, blanking Kepner, on his name. Kepner, uh, Dr. Kepner. Well, Kepner. Yeah, Walter Kepner. So um, he was at Duke, and he treated diabetes with nothing but fruit and rice, and had the best results ever. Nothing but fruit and rice. And so if you did nothing but fruit and rice, and you got moving, exercising, and got that myocellular or intramyocellular fat out of your body, you would then become insulin sensitive, and then you can eat as much fruit as you want. Okay. All right, what about um, since you're recommending that they decrease the oil, a lot of our salad dressings are like three parts oil to one part of an acid like vinegar. What do you recommend in terms of a salad dressing? Three parts uh, acid like vinegar and one part oil. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. A little bit of oil is not gonna kill you. But look, everybody's different, depends where you are. If you're uh, struggling to lose weight and you've got a lot of weight to lose and you're using a lot of oil, take out the oil. I mean, but if you're thin and healthy uh, and you want to put a little olive oil with your salad dressing, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that if I let that oil sneak in, it's like too many calories and I'll start to gain weight. Yeah. Another question from somebody in the audience. I think there's somebody that came in on this too, if you're on your phone. How about caffeine? What about caffeine? Well, caffeine's fine. I, I, um, I mean, the studies go back and forth, but from what I can tell, it's great. Green tea is fantastic, especially uh, for preventing cancer. Uh, black tea is also good, especially Earl Grey. In fact, Earl Grey mixed with green tea is uh, fantastic. So um, uh, those are all good. Coffee's fine. You can drink your coffee. Um, there's some studies out lately that multiple cups of coffee actually good for you. I never used to think that, but uh, it, it looks to be okay. Okay. No. Stevia. Stevia. That's fine. Okay. okay. I was curious, um, 
because I know you've got to, don't you have to do rounds today or something? I don't want to hold you up. <laughs> De Deborah's got you very scheduled. <laughs> um, the patients you see, okay, so there are bees. And, and our county is, as I told you the other day, it's seventh in the nation for metropolitan cities. There's Winter Haven and Lakeland and Polk County, and those are the two largest metropolitan centers. We're seventh in the nation for obesity. First in the state now, aren't we, Debbie, uh, for obesity yeah. for of all of Florida? And where, where, you guys pardon? Where are you located? We're we're one county over from Disney. Well, we're Polk County, yeah. And um, so I remember when we skyped with Dr. Campbell, he said it's it's obesity is so bad because of what it brings with it. And when I was talking, I had a chance to talk to a researcher this summer at Stanford who was working on the microbiome, and she said that uh, obesity brings diseases earlier when we've got younger people becoming obese. So what can you tell us about the risk of obesity and disease and things like that? Yeah, I mean, obesity ties into all these different Western diseases. Obesity is related with cancer. so. Uh, obesity is related with metabolic diseases, uh, diabetes, hypertension. Not every obese patient. In fact, it's kind of where you carry your weight. So if you've got subcutaneous fat, you got to remember that our bodies, if you think of our ancestors, they lived in feast or famine. Uh, they fasted a lot. And, um, and they developed adaptations in order for them to get a lot of calories and to store those calories when calories were available so that when calories weren't available, they could use it. So storing fat was a protective mechanism. Being hungry was a protective mechanism. Um, the problem then comes when we live in this society where there's never a fast and you know, there's 24 seven McDonald's on you know, two in the morning in, uh, in the middle of winter. And so we're driven to eat because of these ancient genes, we call them the thrifty genes, uh, and we're easily supplied this very high calorie uh, food that is made by scientists to taste extremely good, and so it's a bad combination. Uh, and so people are getting more and more overweight, uh, and uh, that's going to continue to happen, especially as we go through all these fad diets and you know ridiculous things like you know it's it's, it's always crazy to me that. We've got such a strong body of literature that says that meat is correlated with weight gain over time. And so the fad diet is eat more meat. Let's go back into meat. I mean, it's just crazy to me. But, um, but I mean, you're going to continue to see that problem until we really address the you know, simple sugars, the processed foods, and the meat consumption, and, and you know the movement, too, and how much we move. It's interesting in Florida. They're, they've been doing some stuff uh, working with the Blue Zones group. Yes, in um, Naples. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Naples and uh, just north of Naples is a coral. Um, coral Springs? Yeah, Coral Springs. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sal is down there. And oh, okay. He's, and, and, yeah, they do it really. They're, they're doing some interesting stuff, working, going to all the different restaurants, asking if they can put Blue Zone specific meals in it, uh, opening up more walkways. Um, uh, educating in the school systems. They've got walking buses for the kids. So instead of buses, they go in this big group walking, picking up people. It's these kind of like uh, these really uh, fundamental changes that we need to make, not necessarily on an individual level, but at a global kind of government level. Mm -hmm. Really good. And um, our county's been doing that. Uh, Nat, can you come tell him just a minute about that? Because <laughs> we, have, we have an effort um, counting why that um, has been looking at how to make our community more, um, I guess it's more walkable and also building that climate, but we've got a long way to go. And uh, it's people like you and talking with us that make a big difference and we really appreciate that. Right. Let Thank me you. check, we've got another question here and another one after that. Good. Hi. Hi. I noticed in your video that your children are vegan, your two little girls, is that true? Good. Vegetarian. They're vegetarians. Uh, and they're young. How old are they? They're 10 and 8. I'm wondering how they deal with peer pressure. Uh, they love it. Uh, <laughs> As an adult, I have trouble dealing with peer pressure. I would imagine it would be a lot more difficult for young children. Oh, they wear it proudly. They, um, 
they it, it's so funny because we got we got a letter recently from a or a phone call from one of their um, friends' moms who was like, your daughter has been or your daughter's been talking to my daughter now my daughter wants to be a vegetarian and it's not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> And then we got another we got another email the other day that my daughter's decided to go vegetarian because of Avery and what can I do how do I do it and, and uh, no they they actually love it they're very you know um, it, I, I'm always worried raising them I don't want to create eating disorders in them you can imagine having a father that's you know nothing about food and so I, I try not to deny them uh, any foods I, I was always like you don't have to be vegetarian do what you want to do but you know when she was like dad isn't it interesting that there's a chicken nugget and then there's a chicken that walks in that, that we see at the barns. I'm like, they're the same thing. She's like, they're the same thing? The chicken? And you know, uh, that kind of changes things. And so I showed them a video, which maybe is a little cool about where chicken nuggets come from. Uh, and they will never eat another chicken nugget. <laughs> but they also go to farm sanctuaries and stuff like that. Like, uh, we went there and they met a, a turkey named Cooper and they loved Cooper and Cooper was chasing them around and like, pay attention to me. And so uh, they, boy, they were evangelists during Thanksgiving talking about things around. You're eating Cooper. Uh, and, and so now my kids, have, my kids have relished the idea. Now, uh, truth be told, they go to a pretty liberal Montessori school where it's a little bit more accepted. I'm sure going to Asheville is gonna be great for them because there's a lot of uh, plant-based eaters there. So I, it may be tough for in other areas, but I've tried to tried to raise very strong opinionated women because they got a strong opinionated body. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, doctor. Uh, my question has to do with pizza. <laughs> pizza is one of my favorite foods. I like pizza too. I have uh, pizza that uh, have no cheese, double the sauce. All veggies. What's exactly. your comment on that? Is that good, bad, indifferent? Yeah, I order. I order all the time. I get Domino's pizza. I get thin and crispy, extra sauce, and I get every kind of vegetable that you can possibly get on there. It's almost like you know, like a salad on a crispy bread. And uh, yeah, I eat that. I eat that often. Thank you. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> that was to my wife. <laughs> I think you made a lot of people feel good today. <laughs> Do we have any more questions for either from live streamers or the group? We've got one more on the live stream asking about lecithin. Okay. Wanting to know about oils. Um, and a lot of people in the group follow Dr. McDougall and Dr. Esselstyn, which is no oils. And this question is about sunflower lecithin and the fact that it is an oil, I think is the question. Um, Alvarado, Alvarado sprouted bread has an ingredient that is sunflower lecithin. What is it and is it oil? No. Lecithin is not oil? No, it's not. But here's, look, this is when people go crazy, okay? You know, so Dr. Esselstyn, I love Dr. Esselstyn, I love Dr. McDougall, they're my idols. But, I mean, the research on all oils being harmful is a little bit vague. There's one paper, but... I don't know that monounsaturated fats are terrible for you. Um, saturated fat, definitely monounsaturated fat. I don't think so. You look at some of the healthiest cultures in the world, they're eating a lot of monounsaturated fat. Uh, it is a calorie bomb, uh, but a little bit's not bad. But you know, when you, it, it becomes really difficult when everything you pick up, you're reading every ingredient, and you're like, oh, this is good, this is good. Oh my God, soy lesson than I can eat. You're just not gonna go through life um, now, you don't want food where the first ingredient on the list is soy list. Right. <laughs> but if it's like the last ingredient, meaning it's the smallest part of the whole thing, it's not going to tell you, look, the vast majority of your diet should be raw natural foods. But if you have a cracker with a little bit of lecithin in it uh, and some hummus that has a little bit of oil in it, that is not going to kill you. And it's a hell of a lot better than everything else that's in the world. And it makes life pleasant. My life is enjoyable. I love the food I eat. I have my Domino's pizza. Uh, it's it's these people that burn. I see these people. I try to go vegan and then I quit. And there's a high rate of, of recidivism. And you start talking to them, and they were like raw fruitarian vegan. Like nothing unless it's kale and uh, and berries. And it's just you know you just can't live a life like I know people that do, and they're 
extraordinarily healthy, but I can't do that. Uh, the, they're fasting every other day. They're, this is it's crazy. We have to do uh, what works for you. Everybody has to figure out what works for them. We have to figure out what works with you. And so the, the, the general principles that McDougal and Esselstyn teach are the same general principles I teach. Uh, they tend to be. If you ever met McDougal, he is uh, you know he's hardcore, and so that 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 seems to like you know for me dealing. I mean McDougal deals. First of all, he deals um, with people that are already buying the message a lot. You know, they will pay him a message. I'm dealing with the Texas rancher uh, who comes in with a beer belly. And a, you have a uh, different and wrong conversation than he has. So I, you know, my success has been in not being that extreme, uh, definitely setting some rules. I think there's some things they, I, I, I often say that sometimes doing something 99% is a lot harder than doing it 100%. So I set rules. Uh, but at the same time, if it's if you're doing 100 percent with every single thing, you're never going to stick with it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, we we have a little something for you that was supposed to be on your desk right now, but Christmas came. So can I open it for you so you know what's coming next? <laughs> can you help me, Vicky, so we can hold it up? Since you run and train. We thought you might like. Oh, I love the, the. I love that. Yes, I know. I love that. You know, book. you know that saying, don't you? Let me read it out loud. Yeah. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. <laughs> and, and and why is that important to you? Oh well, yeah, it has us on the back. <laughs> why is that quote so important to you? Oh yeah, I love that. That's my favorite quote. But, you know, it's um because you know in my treating patients, talking with doctors. Like I said, I'll, I'll sit at a, a, a weight loss survey conference where we're talking about people gaining weight. Um, people, the doctors will be like, yeah, my patient, I did the surgery on them, altered their stomach, and they gained weight. So now what surgery should I do to get them to lose the weight again? And, but no one ever mentions food. I'll sit there for a week, and no one says, well, what are they eating? That just never happens. It's just, it's, it blows my mind. But um, in the same vein, our government, so the, the USDA had their advisory board, and their advisory board said we need to eat less meat, we need a lot of fruit and vegetables. If you look now at the plate that they recommend, it's half fruit and vegetables, a quarter grains, and a quarter protein. They don't say meat anymore like they used to. It says protein, and it says you can't have plant-based protein. That's the USDA recommendation. Now, our food bill, where they give subsidies to, none of that goes to any of that food. It all goes to the protein. Now, some of it goes to grain, but it's grain to feed the animals. That we eat. And so none of it goes to, there's, you know, there's no kale lobby out there. There's no, you know, they don't fund the foods. They don't put their money where their mouth is. And so that's exactly what we have. With the healthcare industry, it's not interested in food. In the food care industry, it's not care the health. They, they want to produce foods that they can sell in bulk. And, and that's what's really making us sick. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it.